In this talk we're going to have a look at the notion and some of the concepts behind input within a game, particularly in terms of a mobile or touch-based game. So we'll do this by looking at it very broadly in terms of the different types of input that we can potentially make use of or capture or otherwise process. And certainly over the years, um, if we're thinking about gaming, uh, there's been quite a wide range of different types of input device that have been used and that which continue to be used. You can see quite a few um, examples of them here, um, from traditional controllers to keyboard and mouse to steering wheels to touch-based uh, to visual through, for example, things like the Kinect. And obviously, each of these different devices, they give us they, they capture a different style or flavor of input and there are some forms of input or movement or interaction that they're particularly suited to capturing and maybe there's other forms of input but they're not particularly great at, at capturing and ideally if we are designing a game we want to make sure that on the device that we're running the thing on that we have a form of input that's going to give us the right level of user control and user responsiveness um, that we need uh, to play that particular game. Just as a, an aside, I mean, th this is an evolving area, so it, it's not one that has stayed static. And there are, maybe over the next 10, 15 years, lots of other nice, interesting areas uh, where input might, might emerge. So you have things like you know, bioelectrical input. Um, this is a particular example, one that would capture uh, activity within the brain. But beyond that, you can also have other ones in terms of uh, skin, muscular uh, actions, things like that that can pick up how uh, a person is moving or what types of processes are occurring under the surface of the skin. Speech input's another one. I mean, a lot of how we interact with other people is through spoken speech. And sometimes for certain types of games being able to say what you want to have happened is maybe a more efficient way than having to otherwise navigate through a, a rich and complex interface and ultimately i suppose in all cases here we are dealing with a system where the user has certain intentions in mind that they are trying to convey and enact within the game uh, and they do that through an interface and interacting with that interface. The most direct way of doing it would be just to get direct interest, access into what they're thinking and then to be able to make use of that. Um, they can do that nowadays, but in a rather, as of recording this, a rather crude uh, mechanism in terms of, of monitoring that people are having a certain type of thought or thinking of a certain thing in terms of um, the brain reactions to it. Now, if you wanted to, you, you could you know, spend a bit of fun thinking about how these things might change or revolutionise or otherwise bring about new forms of, of gameplay to, uh, to players. So for us, we are developing on a mobile device, a tablet, a phone. Uh, so it's prudent that we have a look at what types of input these devices accept. And for current uh, mobiles, and again, th this I think reflects that things will change over, over time. The types of input device that we have presently, and this, don't, this will not apply to all devices, but if you like state of the art at the minute, it would include things that detect motion or movement of the device. So that can include an accelerometer, that sort of detect how the device has been accelerated, accelerative forces. It can include a gravity sensor, so again tying into you know, how it's been held, which way gravity seems to be pulling the thing down, to gyroscopes in terms of looking at movement or rotation of the device itself. Also can include environmental sensors, so things here would be the air temperature, and maybe the air pressure, things like the height, the amount of illumination, how bright or dark it is, the humidity in the air, so again these are other measurable elements that, that phones or tablets can pick up on. And our third category are position sensors. So these are not so much about relative motion and movement of the device, but as to where that device is located uh, somewhere in, in, in space. So they are orientation sensors in terms of which way the device has been held or magnometers in terms of measuring its movement through space in terms of what distance it seems to be moving. So lots of rich um, forms of, of input um, that 
can potentially be captured. And all of these, I suppose, are, are in addition to your normal touch-based input, uh, to in addition to your camera input or to the sound input you get through the, um, the microphone or the camera or interaction with the touchscreen itself. So mobile devices, potentially very, very rich in terms of the types of input that they can accept. The it's useful pointing out this little aside. So for a number of these measurements, and, and potentially your game may make use of these, or it may not, but if it does, then this is relevant. We're talking about three-dimensional movement or three-dimensional measurement to be precise. So for example, if you think about how a device is accelerating, it is within a three-dimensional space. So we have an X, a Y, and a Z axis. Or for gravity, uh, again, the gravitational strength uh, is something that you can measure pulling down on the front of the phone, the side of the phone, or the top or the bottom of the phone. So the, these are our three axes measurements. Uh, so we have an X, a Y, and a Z component. Now, within devices, there is a convention uh, in terms of how these, uh, an X, a Y, and a Z, what it means and how it's represented. And it ties into what's known as the device's default orientation which is the way the device, if you like, has been designed to be orientated by default. Uh, given that def uh, the default orientation, so for a mobile phone, as you're sort of holding it up, looking at the screen, the x-axis uh, traditionally or, or by convention points to the right of the device, the y-axis points up the device, and the z-axis points out from the screen towards the person. And these are arbitrary choices, but that's the convention that's used. For example, the z-axis could point into the phone, away from the person, but that's not the way they do it. Positive z points towards the person from the phone. And it is important to, to appreciate that the default orientation is something that the manufacturer decides. And for phones, it generally is a little bit more straightforward. For tablets, some tablets can be designed to be held in portrait, mode, some designed to be held in landscape mode. But the X, the Y and the Z is relative to the default orientation. Now why that is important is because if you rotate the device, so I'm, I'm holding, let's say my phone is designed to be held in portrait mode, but I'm holding it in landscape mode, it doesn't change the X, the Y and the Z axis. So X will still point to the right uh, as held by the device in its normal orientation. So I were to take a phone, turn it around onto landscape, the right then is probably going to point straight down. Um, so again, it, it is something that doesn't change as you actually move the device. And that means when we're playing the game, either we have to fix the orientation to what we want it to be, or we need to ask how is the user currently orientating the device, and then to uh, take that orientation into account if we're measuring things like acceleration or whatever. Uh, there's a link there too to sort of a good solution on that. Um, other thing about mobile devices, most of the input that we get will be through touch. And if you think about touch, there are actually lots of different um, gestures that have been established and are commonly used. And we want to make sure we're using these consistently if we need to use them. So that can include sort of an ordinary touch, a long touch, a swipe, a pinch, a, a, a dragging something, a rotating of something. So there's lots of different um, gestures that are used at the minute when the player wants to interact with different applications. And we want to tap into those uh, in terms of our game and use the ones that are appropriate to our game. If we're going to do that, there's a few things. So we're designing the game to use touch. We want to make sure that we let the user easily provide this touch input. Now, you might think, well, of course that's going to be straightforward, but this is what we're careful, because we've got a screen that the user's touching. And on that screen, we're going to be displaying graphics. We actually want to show the user things as well as to get their input. So we have to design our input in a way where the user can be playing the game, but are still able to provide input easily. That we're not hiding key information behind the user's fingers or hands or whatever it is they're providing input, that important things are still visible. And games, you generally play them for a reasonable amount of time, so the user has to be able to hold on to the device with a reasonable level of comfort. So you see an example down at the bottom where if we had a, a racing style of game, we might design it so that there's a move left, move right control at the bottom left and right of the screen. 
So what that means is we, we give a, for example, two thumb controls. We design it in a way where the user can hold on to the device so it's comfortable. And we position the input in such a position where the user can provide input while still seeing all of the important things that are happening within the game. So it's good and it's important to think about this in terms of if we're using touch input, it means we're going to be obscuring part of the screen. But let's do that in a way that doesn't disrupt the game, but nonetheless is, is convenient and comfortable for the player to provide. Uh, again, a little bit of, a bit of fun here that you know, if you're looking at the temperature, the sensor that some phones have, you know, how might you design a fun game where the primary input is temperature? Um, not a traditional one, but opens up lots of interesting ideas about maybe how some of these things could potentially be used. So we're going to finish this talk up by looking at the notion of how do we process input. There's two broad mechanisms. This occurs that input is, is detected, uh, or input happens, uh, but then we're in the process of trying to understand what that input is or what it means and taking some appropriate action. There's two forms to this. You have event-driven input, and you have the notion of polling. So event-driven input, the way that this assumes, and, and by default, if we're talking about an Android device where we have some type of view that the user is able to touch, event-driven input is, is what we get by default. That, that's what we're basically provided with. But what happens here is that the user interface, the, the Android, whatever it is going to be, is going to be looking at how the user is reacting or touching or inter otherwise interfacing with the device. And if they detect something like a touch event or a drag event, they're going to create an event saying, oh, the user's touched the screen at this particular position. So that's an event. We have an event handler, which is simply a piece of code that says that if the user touches something and that type of event is generated, give it to me. I know what to do with it. I'll look after it. And for different um, interface components, for example, a button or a text field, you can attach different event handlers to those. So that if the user clicks on the button, then I have um, an event handler that will be called whenever that happens and knows what to do whenever the user has clicked on the button. So that's the notion of event handling. Uh, there is a process that's running in the background that detects these things. Whenever it detects it, it hands it off to your program, but in particular, a bit of your program that has said, I'm interested and I can process these types of events. We can compare and contrast that against the notion of polling. So polling is where at regular intervals, for example, once per update, you go out and you ask, well, what's the state of our input devices? How's the phone being held? Uh, is the user touching the screen? Where are they touching it? So you look for snapshots at a points in time and you regularly ask for a new snapshot. And wherever you detect a change in that snapshot, then you work out, oh, well, something's happened there. What has happened? What input is, uh, has, has arisen since the last time we checked that brought about that overall change? And then from that, you, you infer whatever you need to infer. Traditionally, most games have used input polling um, and for a number of reasons. And again, it's what we're going to be assuming uh, in this particular course. Advantages and disadvantages of this, I mean, not, yeah, there is no clear winner in this one. One advantage is with input polling is it is a low level of control. Um, it, it fits in well with the update render loop because we're going to be updating the game frequently, say 30 times a second. So if we're using polling, we can check, well, what's the state of the input? 30 times a second, so that works in well. It is a low level uh, bit of control in the sense that we as the programmers have to do a lot of hard work. We're going to have to work out, it's really the disadvantage of it, we're going to have to work out what happens over time. Now that gives us amazing flexibility and we can detect as, as complex a set of gestures as we want to, but it's something that we have to do. So the burden falls on us, as opposed to, for example, using a, a built-in set of input events which are detected for us and then we just simply are asked to, to look after them. So the downside, input polling provides a snapshot at a point in time, that's fair enough. And if we have an event that happens over a period of time, for example, a drag, we have to detect and track and otherwise to recognize that particular um, event. So a small example at the bottom, 
the first two images on the left, the button's up. Then the button gets to be pushed down for four frames. Then it pops up back in the fifth frame. And if you actually, this sort of ties in, this, this is done about, about 15 millisecond um, intervals. So we're, we're roughly, roughly on 60 frames a second, something like that. But you can see there that even if we were able to depress and to release a button in, in what, about 70 odd milliseconds, which we're not going to be able to do, uh, bluntly, uh, even that would equate to an activity that happens over a number of frames. So what we can detect from this is that the state is up initially and then down for four frames, then it comes up again. And seeing that pattern, so for example, in the third frame, we go from a position where it was up to a position where it was down. And that change we can then detect as, oh, this is the button being pressed. We go across then to the last, the seventh frame. Uh, previously in the sixth frame, it was down. Seventh frame, it's now coming up. And again, we detect that change and we interpret that change. This is an example where we had it pushed as now it's been released. So that's an example of a released event and also a typed event. So typed is where you push something down and then release it, as opposed to just pushing it down or just releasing it. So a little bit more work involved, but we get more control um, out of it. There are some things to be careful of in this, uh, sort of pitfalls. And there's a, a section of code that you want to avoid. So we update our game. So we're calling this, say, 30 times a second. If the launch key is pressed, then we launch the projectile. The problem with that is that, at, say, 60 updates a second, we will launch the projectile 60 times a second. Um, so as opposed to maybe something you imagine will only be sort of firing once or twice a second, you get 60 of them a second. Um, so quite often you want to put guards in. Um, equally, if you have, for example, an animation, whenever the animation plays, you might want the animation to finish before you're willing to accept a new input event. So we, we have conditions and the general form you can see down at the bottom. So an update generally will work out if an input event has been detected. And then the events uh, or, or what the actions associated with those events can have a series of guards. What conditions must be true before we're allowed to execute those um, uh, actions? So in the case of, for example, the launching the projectile, we could say, well, when was the timestamp of the last time we fired one? And let's just check the timestamp against the current time. If it's more than half a second, then we'll create a new one. If it's less than half a second, we'll ignore that input at this point in time. And so on. Decoupled input is, is another way of looking at this. Um, you see two examples over on the right-hand side. The one at the top is where it's coupled together. So in consider input, we say that if the A button or, or whatever has been pressed and we do some action. Now, that's fine, but it ties the two things together. The example at the bottom is a bit more flexible. So initially we check for input and then we consider that input. So in checking for input, we're asking, okay, if the A button or the J key or, or whatever we want to option to provide the user, we set some flag or, or some variable to indicate that a certain type of input has been detected. And then we consider that, and if we detect that type of input, we do some action. So this decouples the two. So we're saying that we, are, we have a certain class of input, and based on that class of input, we take some action, but we're given the flexibility to change the input that will generate in that particular thing being true or being detected. Uh, so again, useful thing to put in. So enables input mapping uh, to be separate from the code that responds to the events. That gives us uh, programs more extensible and more reusable in the longer term. Takeaways in this, I mean, it's, it's very straightforward. There's only two of them. Uh, tablets, smartphones, they, they, they do support a wide range of different types of, of input. This gives lots of interesting things we can do with it. For us, I suggest we're looking at input polling uh, so we want to detect changes from one update uh, to the next update and then to work out what those changes mean by way of actions and then detect some appropriate action suitably guarded based on that input. Alongside this, we'll, we'll have a, an input demo where we'll have a look at the demo code and we'll go through uh, in that really sort of single touch and multi-touch um, examples because for most games, that's going to be the style of input that we will be supporting.